trustees and our secretary are so cooperative that even a single single attention rada is everything is taken care by sisters by kothari for this union thank you sir it is rather a coincidence that we are going to discuss thoro on the birthplace of mahatma and this is one more thing that this aryapanya gurukul whom we call tapo tapo bhumi and our founder father puja nanji said who was highly influenced by gandhian thought and he also believed in high thinking simple living he firmly believed that women empowerment is impossible without a proper synthesis of time tested tradition and modern demands of the wide spectrum of activities thus he established such a divine tapabhumi his daughter savita didi who courageously treaded in the footsteps of her father and dedicated herself to the task of women empowerment it is because of her sadhana the whole land of gurukul has been vibrant and thus it is high time for us to listen professor rupin sir on this vibrant land i would request professor rupin sir to throw light on thoro and enlighten us please sir. Greatly respected Chairman Sri Mehta and uh, Mrs. Mehta, esteemed Principal of this College, Dr. Nagar, it is really a great honor for me to have been invited to inaugurate this important seminar. watching the opening session that we have just witnessed i was moved by the custom and the ceremony i'm thinking of yeats's poem a prayer for my daughter which i think many in this audience know very well how but in custom and in ceremony are innocence and beauty born so custom and ceremony are very important parts of our life and i can speak for myself and also in behalf of my wife dr jyoti that this forms a kind of a spiritual and a mental preparation for the kind of intellectual exercise that we are about to embark upon this morning and this afternoon and i would like to repeat what has already been said in praise of dr nagar indefatigable indomitable and full of creative energy both my wife and i when we drove in in the enova station wagon Dr. Nagar was going ahead and walking so vigorously. My wife remarked to me that he is going to beat the Innova. <laughs> <laughs> so this happy occasion is the product of his efforts, of course, supported by his team, invaluable team. So many names have been taken, and. Uh, very impressive roster of names so let me begin with my paper which i will curtail because i see that the whole text is printed in the civilian so would it be all right to have another if i skip some passages because i know we are short of time 
so I will skip some passages. So this international seminar, being held to commemorate the bicentenary of the birth of Henry David Thoreau, being held at Porbanda, doubly important as has been said just now, where Mahatma Gandhi was born, uh, confers upon the event an added historic importance that the students of this college, I have no doubt, realize and appreciate. And I'm going to request Dr. Nagar later, unofficially and informally, that uh, we should prepare a report on this seminar, which can then be published in the Thoreau Society Bulletin, which is an international bulletin on Thoreau. Uh, Thoreau's essay, which we are considering, Civil Disobedience, was delivered as a lecture and then published a year later under the title Resistance to Civil Government. This distinguished audience is, of course, well aware of the essay having influenced greatly Mohandas Karanchand Gandhi to the extent of its having been instrumental in changing the course of history through its powerful advocacy of passive resistance and non-violent protest. Not only in India, but as has been said a few minutes ago, in the USA by Martin Luther King and in South Africa by Nelson Mandela. For his refusal in 1906 to refuse to capitulate to the insult, the indignity of being ordered by the South African government to be fingerprinted like a convict. As all of us know, convicts are fingerprinted. And uh, Gandhi, of course, resisted that insult. He declared that he never spent a night in jail without opening his trunk, taking out the essay, Civil Disobedience, and re-reading it. But it was not just that insult. It was also the Mexican War, which uh, Thoreau opposed and refused to pay his tax. And also, it was his resistance against the institution of slavery, which all of you, as students of literature and history, know very well, was a great and rampant injustice to a huge black population in America. Uh, when I first visited that country in 1964, which has been just alluded to by uh, uh, Dr. Nagar, at the railway station, there were two toilets, whites and blacks. And uh, I, of course, was shocked. This was 1964. Now, there is no such thing. The toilets are all gone. So, uh, one can see how the efforts of uh, great thinkers like Thoreau and others, Mahatma Gandhi, how this has erased and abolished this distinction between all members of the family of the human race. Uh, simultaneously, while India's freedom struggle was underway, I'm just going briefly over history which all of us are familiar with, but I think it's good to be reminded. The world was hit in 1929 by the devastating economic crisis, the great collapse of uh, uh, capitalism, as we all know very well. And uh, what resulted in uh, vast unemployment, the working classes going on strike, in many ways, a kind of a repetition of the French Revolution, which all of you know was one of the greatest events in European history. Not just European history, but also world history. And then, of course, later this was followed by the Great War, 1914 to 1918, and then later by the World War, 1939 to 1945. Interestingly enough, at this time, Mahatma Gandhi decided to side with the Allies, not with Germany and Japan. Netaji, as all of you know, felt that Mahatma Gandhi's attempts were too passive. 
He said that one must resist the bullet with the bullet, the sword with the sword. And interestingly enough, my uncle, that is my father's eldest brother, he was in Burma at that time. We were all in Burma, in fact. And uh, the Japanese invaded Burma, as all of you, many of you may be knowing. And he agreed with Netaji's philosophy, not with Mahatma Gandhi's. He joined the Indian National Army and served under Netaji. And uh, later, I asked him many times to write his memoirs, but he never did, unfortunately. Uh, in the course of the exchange with the Japanese army, uh, Japanese uh, major gave him a slap, and he slapped him back. So that was, of course, an extremely serious thing to do, and he was in danger of being executed for having done that. Uh, Nintachi came to his rescue and said, no, if your major slaps him, he will slap you back. So, in a way, that was a lesson for the Japanese, that Indians were not to be cowed down so easily. Uh, resolutely uh, committed to, I just refer briefly here to the Dandi Salt March, which all of you as residents of Gujarat must be knowing. I was checking with uh, Professor Mehta as to where exactly Dandi is, the run of Kutch. Uh, my wife and I would have loved to go and visit that important site, but there is no time. And Professor Mehta tells us that there is no real uh, significance in terms of geographical aspects. It is more a symbolic, it is more a symbolic uh, gesture that uh, Mahatma Gandhi made. And uh, symbolic gestures, of course, are in many ways, as you all know, more important than actual physical monuments or uh, whatever one might set up in terms of brick or mortar. Uh, as you all know, many of you know, outside Rashtrapati Bhavan in uh, New Delhi, there is a huge kind of a bronze effigy, effigies of Mahatma Gandhi leading his followers on the salt march to Dandi. I think those figures must be about uh, double the size, perhaps, of actual human beings. Uh, very moving, very effective. Mahatma Gandhi with his lachi leading the way resolutely. Interestingly enough, and this may come as a surprise to you all, students, Lord uh, Irwin was the Viceroy of India. And after the march was over, he congratulated Mahatma Gandhi and said, that was, I quote exactly, you planned a fine strategy around the issue of salt. You planned a fine strategy around the issue of salt. So it's amusing that even the British, though they were our rulers and our conquerors, they recognized the tremendous power of Mahatma Gandhi, uh, spiritual, mental, intellectual, in defying the power.